I would like to you to our event under the title question, Shaping the, fru the Future Through a Radical Defense of Humanism. We will look at the current challenges societies are facing in Europe and around the whole world. We are on the eve of the 200th birthday of Friedrich Engels, the closest friend of Karl Marx, who was author, entrepreneur and spin doctor of European socialism. Actually, we had wanted to celebrate the cheerful son of Wuppertal with an event of our own, but unfortunately this could not be realized, out of obvious reason, as you might know. That is why we are dedicating this evening to him and we'll certainly come back to him in the course of the conversation. My name is Anja Kruke. I am head of the archive of social democracy of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Bonn. In a sense, this archive is the collective memory of the German labor movement. It collects the documents of the Social Democratic Party of Germany and its surrounding organizations, as well as those of the trade unions and of well-known and unknown personalities from this field. The Museum Karl Marx House is also part of this institution. In 2018, we opened a new permanent exhibition from Trier to the world, Karl Marx, his ideas and their impact to the present day in his birthplace to mark the 200th birthday of the Universal Scholar. In the last room of the exhibition, you will find a collage of internet snippets on the state of the world seemingly randomly cut out together. If you look at the whole loop, you can also discover Paul Mason, who says a half sentence about utopian socialism, which is cut out of an interview. I'm very pleased to welcome him here with us tonight. Welcome, Paul. And I would also like to welcome Martin Andres as the second guest on our digital podium. I would like to introduce you to both of our guests. Martin Andres, I will start with him, is Professor of General Sociology at the University of Trier. He is chief editor of the scientific journal Human Studies, a journal for philosophy and social sciences, and member of the Leibniz Society of Sciences in Berlin. His research interests are manifold. I might mention the two most recent publications as examples. Together with Silke Niesen and Georg Wobruber, he has published on timeliness of democracy, structural problems and perspectives. Here he wrote the part about the Weimar Republic as a mode of current social self-understanding. And a few months ago, Martin Andres and Christian Janssen published the anthology Marx in the 21st century, Conclusion and Perspectives. I have it here with me. You can have a look. It's a big one. I would like to thank you very much for your willingness to take part in the digital discussion here this evening, Martin. Most of you probably know Paul Mason as the author of the book Postcapitalism, uh, A Guide to Our Future in German Grundrisse einer kommenden Ökonomie, with, those translation, uh, with, uh, with whose translation he achieved a great success in Germany in 2016. He is an English author and award-winning television journalist. He has worked for the BBC and Channel 4 News for many years and writes regularly for The Guardian. Since 2007, I think, he has regularly published books on socio-political issues, most recently, Clear Bright Future, A Radical Defense of the Human Being, from which we borrowed the title of our evening event. For this book, he received the Erich Fromm Prize, which is given to persons who, I quote, um, with a scientific, social, socio-political or journalistic commitment, have achieved or are doing outstanding work for the preservations or recovery of humanistic, humanistic thinking and acting in the spirit of Erich Fromm. Congratulations, Paul. <laughs> you will now first present the central aspects and thesis of his book, which, he, which we will discuss together afterwards. Under your respective streams in English and German, you can write comments and questions in the chat, which I will then take up in the, in the discussion. And now I wish us good insights, a fruitful discussion, and also fun in the following 90 minutes. Paul, I give the floor now to you. Um, happy birthday to Friedrich Engels tomorrow. My book 
Clara Lichter Zukunft was written as a response to a moment when three crises came together. They are the failure of the neoliberal economic model, the attack on democracy by the author authoritarian right, and the seizure of technological control by technological monopolies. For me, this combined crisis is what characterizes our present. It is still on the way. And of course, it is amplified by the COVID-19 crisis. And it, it is always interacting with the bigger overarching problem of climate change. When I wrote the book, and I started writing it almost on the day Donald Trump was elected, um, the dynamics of the crisis were clear. We have in the West an economic model that no longer delivers growth and prosperity for enough people. And the cause is our failure to rethink capitalism after the 2008 crisis. Second, we're see seeing as a result of this, the evaporation of belief in democracy. Support for the rule of law is eroded. Uh, democratic institutions in several countries are eroded. Not all of those countries want to use the term illiberal democracy, as Victor Orban does. Um, um, someone is saying to me that you can't hear me, but I hope you can. Um, but not all the countries want to use the term illiberal democracy, but that's what they're creating. The existing semi-dictatorships of Russia and China are also using their soft power to help every disintegrating factor. Every racist, every oligarchic party, every misogynist is helped. Thirdly, we're seeing a crisis of technological control. We've seen the internet between 2011 and 2016. The internet has changed from being a machine for inciting rebellions into a machine for spreading hate and harassment and exerting algorithmic control over our behavior as voters, consumers, and citizens. In the book, I argue that each of these three crises are linked because they're underpinned by what I call the crisis of the neoliberal self. The crisis that opened in the mid 2020s with the rise of populist right wing parties into government, not just on the edges, but into government is significant because it's the first time we've seen a split in a formerly unified elite. Until Brexit and Trump and Bolsonaro and Narendra Modi in India, there was a kind of consensus on neoliberal globalization. Attempts to deepen globalization through TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, fair enough, they had stalled, but the consensus was we keep globalization and openness. Trump and Brexit, and all the other parties I mentioned, signal that new factions have arisen within the bourgeoisie that are dedicated to a new form of neoliberal nationalism. What I call in the book, Thatcherism in one country. To get into power and to stay in power, and this is important, to create the illusion that their power is irreversible, they were prepared to court the opinion of a section of the electorate that was already voting for racist populist parties. That's what Trump did, that's what Boris Johnson has done. That is what the new pattern of right-wing authoritarian conservatism is. You could say, so what? It's not the first time capitalism has two factions. The problem is that the central idea of neoliberalism was that globalization plus free markets plus democracy constitute the end of history. Nothing better could be imagined. The simultaneous emergence of these neoliberal nationalists blew that up apart, and it for me signals a turning point very similar now to the early 1930s. These countries will carry on trying to pursue the broken, 
unjust free market model domestically. Deregulate businesses, reduce wages, burn carbon, privatize everything, but they will dump some of the social costs as much as possible onto other countries through protectionism, through trade war, through blocks on immigration, ultimately through razor wire at the border, as Viktor Orban has erected. Now, here's the interesting thing. They weren't just prepared to use the rhetoric of populism. They also wanted to produce a technologically empowered populism. Every one of these parties has used the weaknesses or the designed flaws of Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, to manipulate opinion and to attack the concept of truth and to attack the concept of press freedom. When Lehman Brothers crashed, I said to my colleagues at the BBC, look, you need to realize this is not a 10 year crisis we're entering. It's the end of a 50 year period. This is a 50 year turning point. Faced with the Trump phenomenon, I wanted to sound an even bigger alarm. I wrote in the book, we are even now underestimating the seriousness of the catastrophe. This is not some short term political cycle. It's a global attack on methods of thinking, science and evidence based evidence-based policymaking going back to the early 17th century. In other words, this is an attack on the Enlightenment. What Trump is doing, what Boris Johnson is doing, what Salvini in Italy, Orban in Hungary. It's an attack on the very basis of Western society. Everything that, that happened since then, I think, supports that thesis. I lived through the rise of neoliberalism and saw its impact on my community and my family in the deindustrialized region of Northern England. My biggest concern wasn't the economic impact. It was always the impact on people, the kind of people and the kind of thinking it was creating. The concept of social character was Eric Fromm's contribution to Marxism and it's underutilized and misunderstood. Social character allows us to see the way ideology works via the subconscious as well as the conscious mind. And it con concretizes the proposal. Being determines consciousness, not just at the level of class, but at the level of the individual. If I think of my father, born in 1927, his social character was shaped in a collectivist world of solidarity, localized hierarchical society, where the greatest thing you could have was solidarity and authenticity a single character presented to the world in every situation. The typical social character created by neoliberalism was the opposite. People who were experts in self-preservation, of survival in mercurial conditions, all were certain that if you abandon your fate to the market, you will feel better, and all was prepared to deploy a different personality, a different persona or face, into every different situation or website or chat room. Now the market failed, Had the state saved capitalism. And so what happens? Millions of people with this new social character, this multi multiplicity of characters oriented to the market, they end up lost in the dark. We kept the economic model on life support using bank nationalization, quantitative easing, trillions of dollars of extra debt. But you can't keep an ideology on life support because people's brains demand coherence. So people said, OK, the market no longer explains the world. It turns out history didn't end after all. We're back in a world of conflict and pain and insecurity. What explains it? Well, because neoliberalism smashed socialism, stigmatized Marxism, destroyed the organized labor movement, what was left? What was left was nationalism, ethno-supremacy, violent misogyny, and the worship of powerful crooks. Submission to the market, here's the problem. Submission to the market has acted to like a gateway drug to other forms of submission. And what we're seeing now is submission to dem demagogic politicians like Trump, like Bolsonaro, like Boris Johnson. But ultimately, my fear is that it will pave the way for a wider submission to technological control. 
The crisis of technological control, which is only beginning now with the struggle over algorithms, online hate speech, technological sovereignty for Europe, privacy, surveillance. It doesn't exist over there in a world of technology conferences, while the problem of right-wing populism exists over here on the streets with Pegida, with, with Dresden. No, the, the two things exist together in the same reality. They represent a combined crisis. Now, this made me want to do something urgently, which I had avoided as a, uh, a journalist primarily oriented to producing news every day to a thin understanding of reality. I wasn't a theorist, but I am a Marxist, and I wanted to think, what does Marxism have to do in, in the face of that challenge? The British Marxist E.P. Thompson, Edward Thompson, wrote in the 1970s that since the Hungarian invasion, since 1957, there have been two Marxisms, one a doctrine of reason, one a doctrine of dogma. One says humans make history. As Marx says, history makes nothing. The others who, like Louis Althusser, believed, quotes, History is a process without a subject. As I researched and remembered Althusser, it struck me that another word for a process without a subject is a machine. History as a machine is a strong tradition within Marxism. And during the neoliberalism, during the neoliberal era, the differences between these Marxisms seemed irrelevant. Inside, we were both under attack. So inside the Corbyn Labour Party, I coexisted with people whose essential politics are Stalinist. Um, inside Syriza, there was a radical internationalist wing and a Stalinist wing. It's, it's quite simple. But now we are under attack from a different viewpoint, from a different set of enemies. One is the new right. The other is the technological monopoly. So these questions become important. Remember, the journey from Althusser to, to Michel Foucault is a short journey. The post postmodernists taught a generation of students that, quotes, humanity is a social construct. The concept of the human will disappear like a face drawn in the sand as the tide rises. I wondered what tide did Foucault think was rising when he wrote that? Because the tide we face is not the 68 tide. It's the reaction to 68. We may not achieve in this century artificial general intelligence, but we will see specific artificial intelligences that can outthink human beings. Today, corporations ask us implicitly, why should you, the mere human being, have the right to see the data we hold on you and the manipulative tactics our algorithms are using to control your behavior? In future, those same corporations and governments standing beside them will say, why should a human being have a right, have rights over and above a machine? The problem for the left is anti-humanism is everywhere. It's built into structuralism. It's the essence of postmodernism. Now we have with the failure of postmodernism, a turn to overt post-humanism and to vitalism. So now we have the Lebensphilosophie of the pre-1914 era reinvented by people who think they are materialists. So that a plastic cup is designated to have the same potential for consciousness as me, a human being, by the so-called new materialists. If you add the anti-science movement within the left, that said scientific results are always socially constructed. You have a very comprehensive left platform for anti-humanism, and I decided that it was time to stand up against it and to make a choice between what kind of Marxism we need for the 21st century. Marxism in this century is either humanist or it is not Marxism. The lingering conflict between the early Marx with his emphasis, emphasis on species being, Gattungswesen, human nature, essentialism, and liberation conceived as liberation from work, 
the tension between that and the Marxism of the second, second and third internationals has to be resolved. Now, to finish, I think Marxism must return to its humanist roots, a radical humanism. The, the word is there, it's effectively in the 1844 manuscripts. But it needs to do something more. It needs to do what the workers always did, despite Marx. Marx laughed at moral philosophy. He, it is said that he used to burst out laughing when people said the word morality. And for good reason, a very good reason. What does the character Nancy in Oliver Twist, a sex worker, what does she need with a moral philosopher? What does, what does Emil Zola's Nana need with Immanuel Kant? So Marx is right to ridicule Victorian morality. But the interesting thing is the workers did create an alternative moral universe, but they called it class consciousness. In the face of the challenges that are ahead of us, the most important of which is climate change, this new networked generation, which I believe is the new subject of history, must create a class consciousness, or rather a radical consciousness, a radical humanist consciousness. They need to ask, what does a good post-capitalist society look like, a good post-carbon society, and what does a virtuous person look like in the process of struggling for it? Actually, millions of people in the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, Fridays for the Future, are already acting as self self-starting moral philosophers that each of these movements has an implicit virtue ethic and i think it is time for marxism especially because of its aristotelian roots you can't read a single word of marx without understanding its roots in aristotelian philosophy that we should acknowledge that and 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 strive to create a virtue ethic of Marxism for the 21st century. Here's the final reason why. The biggest country on earth, the biggest dictatorship on earth, calls itself Marxist. And I predicted in the book what is happening now. Xi Jinping isn't just gonna sit in Beijing saying, well, we have a Chinese Marxism. They will promote Chinese Marxism as the alternative to what we know as Western Marxism. Its fundamental tenet is anti-humanism, that humanist Marxism was attacked at the very beginning of Deng Xiaoping's uh, liberalization process. There is not an essence, there is not an iota of humanism left in the Marxism of Xi Jinping. Unfortunately, when he quotes Frederick Engels, the, you know, the universe is matter in motion, what he is doing is consciously quoting the anti-humanist Marxism of Labriola, of of uh, of Plekhanov, of the of the of the second international uh, textbook writers. So we we know fighting back in in the name of a of a radical humanist Marxism isn't a hobby or a secondary thing because we are fighting a very powerful ideology that will spread in the twenty first century, and it's not Marxism. That's what the stakes are. Thank you for listening to me. And I hope in the discussion we can cover all those things that are on our minds, front of centre, COVID, racism, the EU, Trump, etc. But that's my intro over. Thank you very much, Paul, for your presentation. Um, I just couldn't um, get my voice back. Sorry for the moment. I think we can now imagine what the main features of the book um, is. I think um, we could discuss five major themes um, you presented to us, the neoliberal self and humanism, technological control, authoritarian right-wing movements, capitalism, Marx, and the topics you all mentioned uh, at the end. That means that we have a full table with <laughs> uh, different topics. And I would like to ask Martin Endres to start and give him a kind of free shot in terms of what would you like to start with, actually, and give you the word now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anja. Um, 
Paul, herzlichen Dank äh, für die Präsentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Ähm, ebenso herzlichen Dank an das Karl-Marx-Haus und Herr Kuke dann für die Ermöglichung dieser Diskussion heute Abend. Es ist ein Vergnügen angesichts der beiden Themen, die du angesprochen hast, heute die Möglichkeit zu haben, das zu diskutieren. Ich beginne mit einer kleinen Positionsbestimmung, die vielleicht notwendig ist. Jetzt sprechen zwei miteinander, die äh, einerseits äh, Paul Mason, der politische Publizist und Journalist, und auf der anderen Seite ich selbst als Wissenschaftler und Soziologe. Das bedingt typischerweise unterschiedliche Stile und Temperament im Schreiben und im Argumentieren. Und ich glaube, das werden wir heute Abend auch ein klein wenig äh, dann beobachten können. Um, insofern ich meine Aufgabe dahingehend verstehe, eben doch an der einen oder anderen Stelle äh, ein paar Präzisierungen einzu, äh, abzufragen und mich für Differenzierung zu interessieren. Grundsätzlich gilt natürlich, dass äh, sozusagen dann in Pauls Augen äh, ein Soziologieprofessor potenziell Träger äh, Anti-Humanism auf die Academic Left ist. Um, und yes, you thought about it. And um, maybe it's well, also the fall that ja, ich insofern zur um, slow moving wave of academic studies gehöre im Unterschied zu dem dynamisch like mit dem Tempo der Weltschritt haltenden uh, politischen Journalisten. Die Rollen sind also sehr, sehr klar um, verteilt. So also beginne ich mit dem Hinweis darauf, so wir teilen ganz grundlegende Einschätzungen über die Bedrohung und Entwicklungen unserer Gegenwart. Das betrifft äh, konkret politische Bedrohungen durch die rechte Extremisten. Es betrifft ökonomische, vor allen Dingen durch marktradikale und digitale Techniken und Praktiken äh, motivierte ähm, Angriffe durchaus auch auf die Demokratie. Es betrifft ökologische Herausforderungen, soziale, die du weniger in dem Buch erwähnst. Ich denke an ethnische Ausgrenzungen oder auch Migrationsbewegungen und durchaus auch kulturelle ähm, Prozesse, insbesondere religiöse oder religiös verbremte Fundamentalismen, die nicht zuletzt in den USA für ähm, in großem Maße für die kulturelle ähm, für kulturelle Schismen oder Kontroversen um, sorgen. Du spitzt nun deine ähm, Krisendiagnose im Kern darauf zu, und ich glaube, du hast es eben noch mal sehr schön zusammengefasst, dass es darum geht, um sagen, ein neues Selbst zu kreieren, beziehungsweise ähm, sagen, es muss bei jeder individuellen Person der Anfang von Veränderung gemacht werden, die nötig ist, und ähm, dafür bedarf es ein, eines neuen Verständnisses des menschlichen Individuums. Es liegt da weniger an die Tradition, europäische Tradition des Humanismus an, als viel eher an den jungen Marx. Gleichwohl würde ich gerne damit beginnen und fragen, wie soll es denn unter den gegenwärtigen Bedingungen gelingen, Menschen dazu bewegen, wie du es schreibst, zu Rationalität, Mäßigung, Normen, Demokratie, Verhalten zu motivieren, also sich dafür zu entscheiden. Ich stelle diese Frage im Kontext der größeren Frage nach der Tugendethik, aber darauf würde ich gerne im Anschluss noch mal kommen. So, first of all, um, yes, um, let's, let's say something um, complementary about journalism and, and academia. The, 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 right now I'm researching my next book, which is about fascism. And I've been reading about the debate within German social democracy after Hitler's breakthrough in 1930, um, where I think it's Theodor Geiger, the fam Panic, in Panic in Mittelstand. It's a really interesting, although wrong, article. And, he, and, and there was a big debate over it. It, it, the debate took place in a journal called Der Arbeit, which was the journal of the 
social democratic trade unions. It was a theoretical journal of a trade union. Now, it may be still in Germany that we have these things, but by and large, my experience as the left is we don't. What we're doing, the left is outsourcing into academia the task of theory creation when when we need, and, and journalists can't create theory, but, but activists, at my sense is that that debate, Geiger versus Alexander Schifrin versus Carlo Mirendorf during the early 1930s was carried out with the input of activists. And yet it was theoretical. So the first thing is one thing that I think um, that looking forward as, as wide emergent, wider movements emerge, is I would love for the Stiftungen in Germany of the workers' parties and the Greens to, to think about how we create a middle layer where theory is created. That, so in that sense, I, I, I have given up attacking academia for its slowness and its lack of commitment. It, it needs to be objective. It needs to be slow. But the, the task of theory creation at the moment needs to take place in a, in a space that we don't have. Um, the, if I understand you correctly, I'm not sure whether I picked up the, the, the end of the last, the last thing. Of, let, let me preempt a kind of, let me preempt a, a criticism. Um, since Althusser posed the idea that there is a epidemi sorry, epistem epistemological break in Marx, between the early Marx and Marx after the German ideology, um, I, would, I would prefer to put it like this. There are two themes. There are two, almost like two Marxes running through, through Marx's own work. And remember, it has been pointed out that Frederick Engels did not take part in that thought process that produced the, the 1844 manuscripts. Engels comes from, from pre-Marxian Hegelianism through a different route that, that doesn't really engage um, at that point. And I think there is a, Mar a radical humanist Marx that survives, for example, definitely in the Grundrisse, in the so-called fragment on machines, definitely in the 1859 preface to a contribution on the critique of political economy, and it certainly in parts of capital, where he talks about human nature, where he talks constantly about freedom and human liberation as liberation from work. So I reject the, the idea that there is a, a split, a break off point with the German ideology, but I think it is true. And if Althusser had put it like this, I would have agreed. It is true that there are two strands and both come from Marx. It's not that Engels imposes a kind of, a kind of, you know, anti-during uh, Marxism on Marx. It is there in Marx. It's there, for example, in the way Marx, I think, has two theories of the working class. He has a theory of the working class that says they self-emancipate because of the ideas in their heads. And another theory which says they self-emancipate despite whatever theory they have in their heads. And this is why um, we need to just, every iteration of the class struggle forces us to, to re-interrogate Marx. And I think I'm, a, I'm very critical of the way in which Marxism became in this sense, a theory of the agency of the working class and not a theory of the agency of human beings. So I don't know whether that answers exactly your question because I was having difficulty hearing towards the end, but that's it. Uh, would you like to react on, on that? Is it a full answer or would you um, like to differentiate the, the last question you had, Martin? Well, um Eigentlich zielte meine Frage auf das Plädoyer. My question was rather about the plea of Paul for a new virtue ethics. Ah, yeah. we, um, you can um, talk about that. Maybe we can come back to that later on. 
What I said before, I would like to take up happily, of course, the early Marx, or rather stands in a tradition of radical republicanism, a position that Engels definitely at no time um, said that it was his. He was um, too much deep into the study of critical political economy at that time. And finally, especially as someone who encouraged Marx, he became really important. This early Marx, um, who had a radical plea for humane conditions and for finally a radical democratical order well as a matter of fact in the economic philosophical manuscripts or um, Paris scripts uh, he is really um, very dominant there this concept of human nature which Marx has developed here, um, you describe as um, um, exposed to severe attacks, technological attacks, and also a fight against truth. In your analysis, you find mainly also the digital perspective, not the neoliberal one, but the digital, right? But question now for me, your argumentation, don't you think that there is a ambivalence everywhere? On the one hand, you have the critical perspective on digitality, digitization. It's um, laying the path as a trailblazer, so to speak, um, because of market processes, observation of all individuals, and that is um, a um, monitoring capitalism, but then you regard it also as a resource, as the potential of a networked individuum, a new network generation, which it can use in order to resist, in order to develop a new ethics, in order to develop a new project, manipulated life. You, in your study, not refer to the age of surveillance, capitalism, but you make it very clear also in what fundamental manipulative way the use of digital strategy is developed, especially of big search machines and the big internet groups and also economic actors behind the backs of the subjects yeah? and the manipulative practices that are there. And therefore I ask myself, beyond any optimism that we always can have, where does this well-founded expectation come from that here at the same time there is a resource for resistance? Okay, yes, thank you. And thank you for turning up the volume of the English translation. That's, that's much easier to understand. Um, so yes, for me, uh, the, the project of human liberation is liberation from work. Now, this is a big uh, challenge for the existing labor movement. Inside the British labor movement, um, really, I'm surrounded by people equally radical, but they, they cannot accept it. People in the trade unions, people in the laborist tradition, the clue is in the name. Uh, it, it, you know, it is an, it is an uh, Arbeiter party. Um, now, for, therefore... I think the insights that Antonio Negri discovered in the Grundrisse in the 1970s, uh, Marx before Marx, become truer with every year that, 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 that passes. Each time I read Negri's work, and he's reading, and, and the original, the, the, the Grundrisse itself, the fragments on machines, I see the basis of a route beyond capitalism that Marx must have imagined. We know that he wrote the fragment on machines during the 1858 crisis. Um, we know it's a fragment, um, but one has to say it is true that, that methodologically it's just very different to capital. Um, it's just, it, 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 it is a different route beyond capitalism because it, 
because it, it sees not even technology, but the, but the technological reorganization of work as, and in, in this marvelous phrase Marx uses, as creating the possibility of a machine that costs nothing and lasts forever. Mm. Now, so yes, for me, the, the optimism is a Marxist optimism. It's an optimism that we can use mass automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, all the infrastructure of self-driving cars, fully automated workplaces, um, to rapidly in the 21st century do two things, free ourselves from work and free the planet from more and more destructive plundering. So the, the reason I think that the question of, well, come to a virtue ethic in a minute, but the question of defending the human uh, the, the, the translation into German says a radical defense of humanism. That's not the intention of the original title, but they, they said it was impossible to translate because it's Menschheit, isn't it, really? Um, but it's the, the defense of the human being is the task of the 21st century because artificial intelligence, surveillance and algorithms, will, uh, will they will be cleverer than us. And if you only, you know, even... You know, I'm thinking even about Christianity. I was brought up in a Christian tradition. The reason man is that it, it, it is allowed to have a soul is because man is the most complex and intelligent being on earth in the Christian religion. When we have cyborgs that are more intelligent than us, they will ask us, on what basis does Christianity not give me a soul? They will simply ask us that. You are a bunch of DNA, bones and flesh. I am a bunch of machine. We are both matter. Um, there is a logic. And so I think that what, what, what I observed when I was started to write this and I asked people, what do you think about Marxism as a form of humanism? Instinctively, many young people said to me, no, no, post-human, we're, we're, we're all going to be post-human soon. We're just the same as machines. We're the product of our circumstance. What I realized is that something in critical theory, and it's deeply rooted, actually, in the critical theory of some of the Frankfurt School writers, some critical theory leads you towards this absolute pessimism. You know, what, what Lukács called the grand hotel of pessimism the Grand Hotel of Despair. Um, and many young people were prepared to say, when there is a machine that is cleverer than us, it should rule the world. Well, that's what Silicon Valley already thinks. And so I now see as Marxism as a kind of liberation theology for human beings. Now, any theology has to have a moral system. Um, and, and I think that, we, the, the answer to the question, why should a human have rights and, and, and an intelligent machine not, must be rooted in the, in, in the Marxist assertion that we have a species being which gives us a telos. Um, for me, the 1844 manuscripts are the most teleological uh, writings of Marx. In other words, people who think that it is Engels who, who introduces teleology in the anti-during and, uh, and the uh, dialectics of nature. No, I think it's the other way around. The teleological Marxism is the beginning Marxism, which says human beings can free themselves. And if Marx knew about DNA, I think he would say it is in our DNA to be linguists, collaborators, technologists, artists. We represent the, the earliest things we leave behind in, as humanity are the cave paintings. Um, because we have these faculties, yes, we make history in, in, in the circumstances that we don't choose, but something always forces us to change things. And it is that. We are the only species where that is true. So if there is a teleology, then there can be an ethos. That's my that's my proposal, and I think that if you that it surprises me 
that it, it, the first people who really thought about this were Bernstein and the revisionists. And what they said is, well, because Marxism doesn't produce an ethos, we have to import Kant back to Kant, return to Kant. We have to import Christian Kantian morality into the labor movement because Marxism can't provide a morality. I think Marxism probably can. You can extrapolate an, an ethical system from Marx. I haven't done it. I'm not a moral philosopher, but I want to Marxists to be to be intelligent clients for moral philosophy. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Paul. I think um, is um, in your book you speak about humanism as a system which has to be um, um, enriched by other humanist traditions. Um, while when you were talking just a few minutes ago, you, it was more like it has to be reduced to the human being and some critical points of ethics. Um, the, isn't it a contradiction in itself? Um, I, I, when I say the reduced to the human being, um, I, I, I probably don't mean reduced to the human being. Okay, so here, here is the way that the working class community I come from evolved an ethos. Um, there were Marxists. There were mainly not Marxists. There were mainly Christians. There were mainly Methodists, Catholics. Um, but class consciousness took the form of, if we are to achieve what we want, which was a series of reforms, actually, not revolution, we have to behave in a certain way. So it is not, although I think domestic violence was rife in this community, It was, not, it was not publicly acceptable. Those who publicly celebrated or committed at domestic violence were, were, were ostracized, even if many people were committing it. Uh, another part of the traditional working class culture, I'm sure it's the same in, in, in Germany, the older industrial areas, was um, the sharing of wages. The, 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 man, the man arrives at home on Friday and gives the entire wage packet to the woman. And then the woman gives the man some back to spend on drink uh, and betting, maybe. Um, and the children get a little bit. That's the, that's the family I grew up in. Now, when you observe that, that's not weird anthropological stuff. It's a moral code. Um, is it the right moral code? Maybe not. Um, It's a sexist patriarchal moral code. But what I'm trying to say is that the working class never believed that, that there should be an absence of a virtue ethic. So now we see a new generation lost in the dark uh, as neoliberalism collapses, highly networked. What do they talk about? What questions do they ask on um, to celebrities or to advice columns. If you listen to what young people ask, they are actually moral philosophical questions. Like, here's a good one that you will always hear if you listen carefully. How many people is it okay to sleep with in a single week? My generation, at my age, we don't have that problem. But always young people are asking themselves this question. Uh, so they are, they are, they are, They demand moral answers. Of course, Christianity gives them liberal, uh, kind of liberalism will give some answers. But it's quite interesting that we have a Marxism that doesn't want to engage in that debate and wants to leave it to liberalism, Christianity, uh, or maybe Buddhism, Zenism. Uh, so, so the answer, so, so, so that it's at that level that I think that I, I think it is sensible for Marxists to engage because, of course, the world has changed. The answer to how many people should you sleep with is very different now. People with multiple personalities deploying different personas can can live several lives at once. That's a new thing through technology. Um, ghosting. Do you know about ghosting? I don't know what the German term is, but it's a form of behavior where people who have had the relationship suddenly no longer communicate at all. The, the fact is, this happens and then people discuss is this right or wrong so i'm trying to give examples of where i think um there is a market for moral philosophical debate i think marxism has a 
a, a basis for which like a store of of ethical teleological values that says if we want a post-capitalist society in which everybody looks after the earth then don't drive an suv that's a moral ethical choice and and it's not do the point I will make, I'll finish, it's not divorced from our teleological view of a post-capitalist project. Okay, I, I, I think I got this, um, um, and that it's not, not um, to be seen as a contradiction. And it's called ghosting in German. Um, <laughs> we use many English words, so... Um, well, let's turn maybe, uh, or let's switch to another aspect of your book. Um, you speak at the end of what can you do about your uh, neoliberal self? How could you turn into an, uh, let's put it my way, into another person? How can you free yourself, emancipate? And you speak of the reflexes. Um, and you might tell us a little bit of what you mean with that. And I think that I also should ask Martin how he understood maybe this, this part of the book uh, in term um, with reference to the to the moral ethics, the Tugendethik. Well, it's always it's, it's um, jeder, jed, jedes Mal faszinierend, weil it's du ein, um, ein Boden aufmachst sozusagen. You um, open up a wide und field, compromising many um, different aspects and, uh, and uh, different stories, so to speak, from your direct daily field of work and what you've experienced, that's very enriching. And I don't think there is a difference between the two of us and in social science. It's actually basically common sense nowadays that in various Western European, not only, but mainly in Western European countries, there's been a major survey, by the way, uh, by one of your colleagues on this, that for some time now, the various uh, labor fields have broken down or the, what you call ethic, this life form, I would rather call it, I don't know, habits or certain ways of life that with, I don't know, cultural um, um, events and stuff that is maybe no longer bearer of a huge trend formation in the society but what is striking nevertheless is the question where is this imperative to act coming from and to explain it a bit that remains kind of open and void the of a young possibly networked generation which via this network is massively controlled, delivers data for more and more surveillance. And uh, you confront this in your book in particular with regards to the aspects that Anya mentioned. You mention a lot of imperatives. The end part of the book is full of imperatives and uh, that is kind of an ethic of should do and not um, a virtue ethic. And of course, one can, uh, with regard to young people, and uh, we're not talking about the two of us, I think uh, we're talking about young people here, um, even though we all should try to improve our daily practices. But the question is, how can you reach out to these people with these kinds of uh, requests or imperatives? That's a question which in the uh, last part of the book remains pretty much open. Yes, now I understand, thank you, yeah. So, um, what I was trying to do in the last part of the book is to say we're at a moment where we need to reconstitute what, what we might call class consciousness. The class consciousness of a different, not just a generation, but even my own, our own generations, what emerges will be a combination of our consciousness and the consciousness of very young people and everybody in between. Um, I w I'm always struck by the writing of the so-called Invisible Committee, the anarchists of the Tarnak Nine, who wrote this book, The Coming Insurrection. They made a very good point. They said our ancestors only had the factory in which to find each other. We have the whole of society. For us, the whole of society is like a factory floor where we have to find the good people, 
the the fighters, find out who are the weak people, the strike breakers, work on them. That's the same job, but it's difficult because we don't have a single arena in which to do it. I the the end of the book is kind of structured as an attack on this introduction that Foucault wrote to uh, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, mm. Oedipus. Um, um, because Foucault himself was writing actually ironically, but he quoted the Manual on Virtue from St. Francis of Sales. Um, basically seven virtues. How do you live your life? Well, and, 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 and Foucault says, how do you live the non-fascist life? What I, I think it's a, an incredibly interesting piece and Foucault's later work where he himself was trying to evolve a virtue ethic for anti-capitalists, I found really interesting because there is, while I agree with the attempt to do it, what Foucault discovered is that there's no theoretical basis for it within his own work. Um, Foucault really evolved towards, by the end of his life, the concept we all use now, which is self-care. And I was struck by the fact of how, how materially determined Foucault's ideas of a new virtues were. They're very quietistic in religious terms. It's very much about fight your inner fascist. Don't oppress people. Don't be too depressed. Don't be too angry. I simply wanted to say that in the era we live in, those Foucauldian virtues of the post-68 era probably don't work anymore. I want to be angry. Um, I, the inner fascist within me is less dangerous than the fascist who comes up to me on the street and says, I know your address, um, and, uh, and, uh, which happens, you know. Um, and I, I thought as well, that the, one of the first virtues of people should be to say, I refuse to be controlled by a machine. That wasn't such a great problem for Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, you know, it, it is for us. Um, also, the idea of resilience, never giving in. A lot of people in the post-68 generation did kind of give in. They retreated to a, an inner world, the life world, you know, um, this generation has no space to do that. They are, they are bombarded all the time. So the list of things I came up with is uncancel the future, think constantly about the future, react immediately to danger, refuse machine control, never give in, and you know, live the anti-fascist life. And I, it, I mean it literally, because now we are stigmatized by Donald Trump. Anti-fascists are stigmatized. So you cannot say, okay, well, no, no, I, I don't care about fascism. I am an anti-fascist. Um, I have to say that this part of the book didn't go down so well with that young generation. It's, it's fair to say. They are attuned through critical theory and through postmodernism to think in a different way. So yeah, um, it's a tough sell, as they say in marketing, but that's the purpose of writing a book is to try and stimulate a debate yes i think that that works martin just started i thought yes um <laughs> ich wollte den bogen gern aufnehmen um, um yes the right, i the want right wing to movement to, to tie in immediately um, to start talking about uh, right wing movements denn um, mir scheint, Because ich würde da gern Fragen stellen mit Blick auf eine... Like to ask questions with regard to an analysis that you developed in your book, both with regard to the United States and also comparing this to Europe. You don't talk that much about Europe at that point, uh, but I also want to include here the German um, extremist party, AFD. There's always this line of arguing that losers of um, globalization, uh, identitarian movements, and people without education are the traditional, so to speak, clients of these political strategy. But we have empirical knowledge, for example, from the United States. There have been many surveys and studies after the elections in 2016 that there are less people with 
below par income, below par education, and uh, in the United States on top, um, uh, the topic of uh, white skin and so on. Um, but rather, a majority of Trump voters have college education, just as an example, that the annual income of roughly 20% of his electorate is uh, more than $100,000 per year. And the facts um, always measured against the local uh, income level that his electorate is rather part of the richer income people and the paradox on is that in 2016 in this middle income segment between 15 and 100 thousand dollars trump did beat hillary clinton so that means trump does or rather did fortunately um, do politics rather for the rich but nevertheless he managed to what we call here the middle level, upper middle level, um, that's how we call it here in Germany, they were covered by him. Paul, maybe could you um, explain this uh, just two minutes also with regard to Germany, this uh, mobilization strategy, which is raising big question marks to me. There are younger or more recent surveys on Germany for AFD voters, for example, we can't really tie it down to very specific milieus that vote for them. There's, a, it seems, a lot um, of a big link to attachment to the church for people who get mobilized uh, for right-wing um, politics and uh, both in negative and positive ways. In the east of Germany, we have a weak church attachment and uh, with regards to AFD uh, voters. But in the south of Germany, in contrast, there's a combination of um, close attachment, uh, which is in contrast with um, the east. And then there's a third development um, with regard to AFD voters, where we have confessional attachment together with less education and a pluralistic society. That's also something that we see in the south of Germany. So by that, I mean um, the traditional or for Europe and last but not least Germany and but also the United States, these theses that we um, were um, dealing with a uh, with people hanging around train stations, which is what they say in France, for example, or um, it was um, capitalism or um, local politicians say it's due to the debt, um, but none of this is sufficient in order to explain the mobilization potential of right-wing movements. So maybe that would be my question. What your take on this is, what answers you can provide, that would be really helpful. Okay, so some of this is in the book Clara Lichter Zukunft, and some of it will be in my next book. Uh, I don't want to an go anticipate it too much because I'm still in the research stage of that book. But what I argue is that um, we are not dealing here with um, a phenomenon that is driven primarily by economic interest. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's also true that that was also the case with the with the Nazis' rise to power, um, that the, what link, what is linking our situation with the situation of the breakthrough uh, of Hitler in 1929 is the collapse of an ideology. There is a great essay by a French historian called Lucie Varga, which is published in German also, um, where she wrote, uh, she visited the Vorarlberg region of um, Austria to do anthropology with Nazis in the early 30s. And she describes it very well. Varga was one of the early political religion the, uh, theorists. She describes the collapse of the existing, in their case, Catholic, the existing Catholic ideology collapses due to the Wall Street crash and also uh, 
modernity, uh, the you know the the speeding up of everyday life, and Nazism just moves into the gaps. This is what I think we're seeing everywhere. So you can't look at income levels. What we're looking at are, and I, this is what I wrote in the Clear Bike Future in Clarity to Zukunft. We're seeing the collapse of a self, of a, of a belief system. And, and into the gaps, and I have a much better understanding now because I've been studying the Nazis, the Italian fascists, etc. What is happening is that the belief system of neoliberalism collapses. And it was a very logical, clean belief system. The market self-corrects. It's one sentence. The market will correct. Or as, as uh, Friedman put it, the market is, is an... Is an emergent intelligence it's an autonomous machine that can run things better than you when this belief system collapses there is no belief system left and indeed indeed this is not in pluralistic zukunft but it's what i'm studying at the moment karl mannheim had a very good description of what happened under fascism he says look you've got ideologies which work kind of passively uh, on their own and then Mannheim uses the word utopias. You've got these other kind of ideologies that are actively created and have no relationship to facts. They are simply what's in the minds of the people, what they want to happen. I think we can explain Trumpism and the 7 million extra votes for Trump um, through that. Um, and if we look at the IF Day, what unites those different uh Parts of the IF Day is not economic circumstance, but it's the fact that their ideology has fallen apart. Let's remember, for those Turingen, uh, Niedersach Saxony uh, voters, you've got um, you've got people who's who've been through their in, in their lifetimes the collapse of two ideologies. First of all, the GDR ideology collapses, and then the neoliberal ideology no longer explains the world. And they don't like the migration, so so I that mean, um, that's the case in the eastern part of Europe, uh, of Germany. Sorry, yes, um, but we have the AfD also in the western part of Germany, and there you have the fast um, a combination between a strong religious belief on the one hand, economic settlement on the other, and uh, a right wing voting. So this doesn't uh, meet your thesis. No, okay, but but I think that you could also say. Uh, right, this is the other part, and I think this is underdeveloped, but it's there in Clear Bright Future. And again, something I'm writing more about now okay. is I, I now think that misogyny um, is the greatest driver of the crisis of uh, modern liberalism. So my my guess is, for example, look at Hispanic the Hispanic vote for Trump. Why would Hispanic people vote in great numbers for Trump? Because because there are Hispanic misogynists, uh, and and in other words, the the lingua franca of the far right now, and the the thing that links Trump to the po real populists to the extreme Nazis in America is is both white supremacy and violent misogyny, and I wrote in the book, and I also wrote this in Post Capitalism. We have really underestimated what a huge revolution the what, what we call the technological reproductive shock, mass access to contraception and therefore control over reproduction by women, we've really underestimated what the impact of that is, is in a crisis. It's not just that men compete with women for jobs. That's obviously there. The whole ideology of masculinity is called into question by this. Um, and in my studies right now of far-right ideology, the misogyny is like a conveyor belt into right-wing politics. Um, it's why maybe 90% of, of the activists in far-right groups right now are, are men. And my, I don't know the, I don't know which area. Are we talking about uh, Schwabische uh, area? Are we, yeah. Exactly. So, which is, so it's a Protestant area, yeah? Um, so... I don't know, but religious fundamentalism is is also part of it. Look, I think we have to we have to do what Eric Fromm did. We have to give out um, questionnaires, and we have to find out what people answer when we when we ask them. You know, what are your values, and why are you drawn to this? Um, 
I do think I want to say one thing because we're in virtually in in Germany right now. I am virtually there with you. Um, I do think that there is a problem inside the German uh, political public life, which says, looking at from the outside, it says this can't be happening. You know, when all the prepper networks were discovered in um, in the Mecklenburg, when the KSK unit had to be dissolved uh, by by MKK, so, you know, people said, ah, oh, yeah, well, we've got some Nazis in the military, so many that we had to actually dissolve a unit, but it can't be happening. Meanwhile, AFD can't really be happening. Um, we have an anti-Nazi constitution, but then 500 guys dressed in brown uniforms can, can still march through Hamburg or wherever it is they march. This is very strange to us because, because you know what? In Britain, we have a, a big far right. I've been undercover on their demonstrations. They are dangerous. They are horrible. But really, if, 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 if like 500 guys were found in our armed forces, mm. people would go crazy. Um, we, we found about 10. And in fact, it was found through the, via this, I think, we don't know this, the inf investigation into the KSK prompted immediate action inside the British, uh, by the British state against some people who we think were linked to them. So um, the thing is, I don't know why it is that there's a kind of, we have the constitution, so it can't be happening. Um, I would say that the levels of far right uh, mobilization, radicalization, terror in Germany are higher than they are in Britain. Uh, and yet the levels of action by the government don't seem commensurate with that. I don't want to sound anti-German here because I think the German constitution is a model for the rest of the world. We should all be following that constitution. What the, this, this, you know, for example, they designated 7,000 members of IFD as extremists. And so the IFD had to shut down this flugel wing. That's good. We should praise that. But it just puzzled me why there is not more panic. Let me jump into the discussion. I think the breakdown of the belief system produces, um, it, it needs some time to produce a crack in your own ideology and of your own world. Leon Festinger called it the cognitive dissonance, you, uh, you know, the, the moment it breaks up. And I think um, maybe, this, maybe this could moderate between the two um, points of view on who might uh, vote the, the AFD. Um, but I would like to go on uh, with the discussion to the question, um, if we look at the, at the far right movement, um, would you say, you and, and Martin, uh, what do you think of the, the role of the COVID-19 crisis right now? Um, is it an accelerator uh, for, for the crisis? And I would like to know, or like to ask you, um, which area, in which area does it have the strongest effect? Capitalism, digitization, or maybe the far right movement and, and a further march towards um, white supremacy? Well, I, I, let me briefly answer. I, I, I am not so. If we get the va the vaccine, I, I think I'm not so worried about a prolonged Lehman Brothers style crash anymore. I was at the start. I now think the biggest economic effect is that in countries like Britain and America, which really screwed up their their um, response, we have a big fiscal overhang. So the future ability of the British government to borrow in a crisis is really, you know constrained it's it's its ability to borrow to do green new deal is constrained that's the economic effect the there's lots to talk about in britain to do with corruption but this is it's a secondary issue for this discussion um what we saw is exactly what you have seen and what's been seen in in america which tells us that there's this is a global spontaneous thing the the existing conspiracy theory of the far right QAnon, I think you say it differently, QAnon, yeah, QAnon. What is it? Um, it's like, it's quite similar to the protocols of the elders of Zion. It, it, it tells us, that Arendt made this point, Hannah Arendt made this point, that the German, that the Nazis said, we learned to be powerful and devious 
from the Jews because we read about it in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I think Goebbels said we learned everything about how to be powerful from what it says here. So we need to understand that far-right mythologies are always about what they intend to do. QAnon says Trump will put Hollywood, Jews, etc. in jail. Okay, he says it says there will be a crackdown in which the liberal elite will be jailed. Uh, that's what they want to do. That's what they want to happen. Now, what then happens is that QAnon functions like a black hole. Everything that comes near it gets sucked into the black hole. So what comes near it? Comes near it first, anti-vaccination. And th then the anti-vaxxers get sucked into the black hole. Next is uh, anti-5G masts. You know, the, then that gets sucked. In. Next is it's a Chinese virus invented uh, as, a, as, a, as a chemical weapon by Xi Jinping. That gets sucked in. And what we have observed here, because my friends went uh, into these demonstrations, I didn't go, is that they meet each other and they just start swapping conspiracy theories. What's happening always, and I know that it happened on this Bundestag uh, assault, is standing next to them are the actual Nazis. Always there. Always there. The actual Nazis say, you know what, we've got a solution to this. Because then you get the thought architecture. The final thing that's been added to QAnon is the so-called Great Reset. I don't know if you heard about this. Klaus Schwab, the chair of the World Economic Forum, published a document about how to reform capitalism. It's actually a very comprehensive liberal contribution to the renewal of a green capitalism. There are things to criticize about it, but I, I saw it at the time as a really interesting attempt to do what I called for in post-capitalism, to come up with a reform to neoliberalism. And what's amazing is immediately the QAnon people wrapped it into their theory. So now the Great Reset is part of the New World Order's attempt to make everybody be vaccinated, and they will impose uh, climate change targets on everybody. So everything the liberal elite does now is reinterpreted through QAnon and through the Great Reset. So, yeah, I think this is dangerous because we're now seeing what we call pastel QAnon. We're seeing young mothers whose only interest is like uh, they're against paedophilia and, and maybe they are worried about their child having the vaccination. Uh, now, as soon as you go online and click vaccination, you are immediately in the world of the far right. And it's very dangerous. Yeah, I would agree um, that the uh, cultural um, perversion under COVID conditions to spread. I try to do that in another form. I would stärker hervorheben, dass sich eine Kultur kultureller Polarisierung stark Und diese Form, die mit der man sagen zahlreiche äh, Mitbürger und Mitbürgerinnen ausgrenzt, ob nun ob religi ob religiöser, sexueller und welcher äh, äh, Eigenschaften oder zugeschriebenen Identitäten auch immer. Äh, ich glaube, das scheint mir ein großes Problem zu sein. Da müsste man an die Hintergründe gehen. Da bin ich mir noch nicht so sicher, ob das wirklich der Kollaps von, der, der, ein Kollaps von Belief Systems ist. Ähm, das kann nämlich genau das Gegenteil auch sein, nämlich intensive Ausprägung von Belief Systems. Karl Mannheim hat darüber ähm, schöne Studien über die We zur Weimarer Republik ähm, vorgelegt. Es kommt in meinen Augen hinzu, dass ähm, die demokratischen Gesellschaften in nicht hinreichender Weise darauf vorbereitet sind, dass es rechte Bewegungen vermögen, den Rechtsstaat gegen sich selbst zu wenden und sich selbst in eine Position der, der Rechtsstaatverteidiger zu setzen. Das erleben wir vielfach bei Argumentationen von der AfD, jetzt beispielsweise auch im Zusammenhang mit, mit Diskussionen über Maßnahmen zu Covid-19. Wir erleben das aber genauso auf der Ebene, auf der europäischen Ebene, bei, ähm, bei Orban beispielsweise. War, da wird versucht, sozusagen den die rechtsstaatlichen Dokumente, die im Zuge ähm, der europäischen Akte entwickelt wurden, dann wiederum gegen die Politik äh, der EU jetzt zu wenden. Da scheinen mir zentrale Bruchstellen zu liegen, 
die die Wehrhaftigkeit unserer Demokratien einfach äh, betreffen und wo dringend sozusagen nachgearbeitet, nachjustiert oder deutlich klarere Politikstrategien angesagt sind. Can I just say one more thing? Um, that obviously there are people who are expert in how you de-radicalize extremist people. We need to develop the same expertise in how to address people who believe this stuff. There are strategies and there, are, there, are, there is also evidence. I know there are British sociologists working on the evidence. One of the problems is that, that, that they are said, it's said that they react badly when being contradicted. You have to be able to say, yes, you may have a point here about vaccination. Let's explore it some more, but let's take it away from the idea that that, that there's going to be a race war in Europe. Let's take your individual thing. Um, I think what I would say to politicians and political strategists and anybody in public life is that I think it's important to proactively contradict them. That is what, what a lot of social democratic politicians are currently in Britain. They're sitting, the, look, they're surrounded by misogyny, white supremacy, conspiracy theory. And what, what they say is, let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about a Green New Deal. Let's talk about housing. And, and you say, no, my, my advice to them is always, let's talk to your constituents about this QAnon thing. You raise it. You should say, have you heard that there's this weird theory that everybody's talking about? I want to tell you that it's wrong. That's what I think we have to do. Because it's, it's, it's the old problem of Wilhelm Reich you know, says this about the KPD in uh, the 30s. He said, uh, you, you know, you could hire the Sportpalast in Berlin. Uh, and the KPD hired the Sportpalast and they read out the economic statistics about unemployment for hours, hours and hours. And 3,000 people watched it. And two nights later, Hitler hired the Sportpalast and talked about blood and honor. Um, this is the problem. If, we, if we, we cannot beat them with economic statistics, You have to take their arguments on. So I think that, um, you know, we, we, we need to be much more intelligent and learn about how to engage some very frightened and confused people. I don't know if you saw it on the internet. There was this thing that I, I don't know which city it happened in, but it was a Kverdenka uh, mobilization two, two or three days ago. And a woman stands up and compares herself to the white rose activist Sophie Scholl, who was hanged by the Nazis. And the security guard took his coat off, gave her the coat and said, you're mad. No, I th this tipped her over the edge. If you watch it, I watched very carefully the reaction. It's when he said, you're mad, uh, that she went, to, she went crazy and ran away. But it, it, what a superb act by that guy. I think all of us have to do in a very reasoned way, non-violent and... and, and And in a reasoned way, that to say to people, you are crazy, but there is a way out of this craziness. Let me show it what, we, what it is. But the astonishing and irritating <laughs> fact is that none of the um, people hearing the speech um, acted against it. You know, no one said anything. That's well. Um, apart from that one guy. And and apart from that yeah. one guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also eine Sache würde ich noch gern, Entschuldige, eine Sache würde ich noch gern ergänzen. Ich fand, Paul hat etwas sehr Interessantes über, über, über deutsche Mentalität, ich möchte den Begriff gerne benutzen, gesagt, dass es eine verbreitete Haltung gibt, der deutschen Gesellschaft könne so etwas nicht passieren, es würde keinen Rückfall geben. Das Fatale ist, auch Karl Mannheim, den du vorher zitiert hast, hat so gedacht, deshalb ist Mannheim in Deutschland geblieben ähm, und war dann vollkommen schockiert, als das äh, Anfang 34 das Gesetz zur Reinigung des deutschen Beamtentums ähm, veröffentlicht wurde. Ähm, also es gibt eine solch verbreitete Tendenz und sie führt weitgehend zur Apathie und zur Hinnahme und zu einer 
ähm, relativen Kultur entspannter Gelassenheit äh, angesichts irritierendster äh, politischer Ereignisse. Das ist sicherlich ein ganz wichtiger Punkt in diesem, in diesem Land. Manche tendieren dazu, das mit einer Kultur der Innerlichkeit, die ihre Wurzeln, äh, Romantik und Protestantismus hat, zu verbinden. Nun ja, das müsste man genauer untersuchen, sicher. Fortunately, I have to come to the last round for us. Sorry. Um, I would like to ask two questions, one to you, Martin, and one to you, Paul. I would like to start with Martin, if it's okay. I would like to ask you in, let's say, prolonging the things you just said, what would be the most important thing we ha would have to analyze, let's say, in Germany, in order to get a clue on how to react on the far right? What are the main points uh, you think we should talk about? and discuss about, and what should we do about it? Cute little question. Um, well, no. Um, also, für mich ist das, <laughs> um, let me switch to German again, I'm sorry. Um, ich unterscheide mich da von I Paul insofern etwas, als dass ich mir Paul viel stärker strukturelle Paradoxien des gegenwärtigen politischen Systems anschauen würde. Also weltdestruktive Effekte, das auf der Ebene der Politik, auf der Ebene der Wissenschaft, sozusagen die Pluralisierung von Wissenschafts- Kulturen und Wissenschaften führt zugleich zu einer ähm, ähm, Ent, äh, äh, wie sagt man das denn, Ent, äh, also Entzauberung ihres Objektivitäts- und Geltungsanspruches. Ähm, wir können auf der Ebene des Rechts ähm, ähnliche ähm, ähm, Prozesse und auf der Ebene öffentlicher Diskussion Ähnliches wahrnehmen. Und diese Paradoxien, glaube ich, sind zentrale Auslöser, die sozusagen im fortwährenden ähm, öffentlichen Kommunikations- und gesellschaftlichen Prozess immer wieder auch die, zumindest die Risiken für solche politischen Radikalisierungen und Extremismen mit erzeugen. Und da müssen wir, glaube ich, ran. Um, what would for you be the, the central task? Um, and I would like to ask two more half questions. <laughs> and what makes you actually confident or optimistic or even uh, confident about our future? And maybe was it also perhaps Engels' approach, who was always optimistic and confident? Well, yes. Um, let, let me let me go back to the question that uh, that Martin started to answer. Um, I, I'll be really concrete. There is a uh, there is a model I think in sociology called the pyramid of uh, of radicalization. Um, law enforcement people use it, and they they have a model whereby you have sympathizers. Like, let me get it up. I've got it here. Sympathizers, supporters, activists and then the violent terrorists. You, that, it, there are many sympathizers, some supporters, few activists, and a tiny number of violent terrorists. I think we have to redraw that model in, in, politically. So now, we, I think we have a three-stage thing, even four. There are authoritarian conservatives that make America great again in Trump, okay? Then there are, there are radical populists, so people who don't like the liberal aspect of democracy, but are prepared to work within it. Then we have the classic violent extremists, the NDP or parts of the AFD. Certainly in Britain, I would know which ones they are. And then there are the terrorists. And the, what, here's the problem we have. Network communications and the creation of a single thought architecture, which they all share, means that in, you don't have to move up the hierarchy in, in a linear way. You can move from being an authoritarian conservative who just supports Trump, and then you go, it's happened this two weeks ago, you go on the Proud Boys demo in Washington, D.C., so you're now immediately into the extremist group. And then you see a left-wing journalist, and they're identified, and you hit them. Mm -hmm. Then you're, you're at the top of the, of the thing. Then you go back home, you expect, this is what happened to this one guy, it's a celebrated thing. He, he was caught on camera attacking a female journalist. So a female journalist finds his name, goes to his employer and says, hey guys, you have a guy who is on camera committing right-wing extremism and he is sad. 
So this is good. Uh, but now what happens is that then the whole thing goes out of control and the fact that he is sacked becomes a cause for the extremist. However, I think our strategy is to be really quite realistic. All I want to do with the terrorist is make them go back to being a right-wing extremist. With the right-wing extremist, I want them going back to be just an AFD voter. With the AFD voter, I want them to go vote for, you know, the, um, Alexander Dobrindt, you know, or somebody like that. I want them to just de-escalate. And I think that the strategies of the, both of the government, so the anti-extremist units of the German government, the, the, the judiciary, the police and activists need to be able to understand that the that we want to de-escalate them, but that the network society allows that the, it's no longer a pyramid. It's just, it's just, it's like a sort of, it's like we, we have it on a, on our stereo systems. It's like the, it's, it's like the graphic equalizer. You can go from top to bottom really quickly to finish on your question of, um, uh, no, I've now forgotten what your half questions were. Um, remind me. It was about uh, opti being optimistic and confident yeah, and Engels. maybe Engels yeah. as an idol for you. Yes, I, I think that, look, Engels is not my idol, but I think what, what we have to, in, well, for the reason of, of, I think that the systematization of Marxism into a physical science was a mistake. And I think I would, if Engels were here and we could share a, be, a, a nice glass of, of uh, of Trier beer together, I would want to say, look, when you said that the kind of base superstructure is like a law the same as the second law of thermodynamics, well, look, here's the third law of thermodynamics. Here's complexity theory. How exciting is it that, that, that what we thought was the end of science was only the beginning of science, and that we now, as Marxists, have to deal with this level of complexity and uncertainty and the levels, the problem of observability that a guy called Werner Heisenberg came along with just you know not long after you died. How interesting would that be? I am sure Engels would engage with that. And that's actually why he is should be our hero, because he was never a dogmatist. And, and it, think how engaged they were with anthropology. Uh, so in, in the spirit of, of Engels, that Marxism is a science, we have to be prepared to also say that a good science can see not only its conclusions questions, but it's questioned and disproved, but its premises can be disproved. We have to rewrite the premises. Um, and what gives me finally my, my, my optimism like Reich, like Eric Fromm, I believe what the far right is, is the expression of the fear of freedom. And the, the reason the fear of freedom is strong is because freedom is actually close. And that they can see that a, a world without carbon and a world with lots of, or a world without work is quite close. And they're frightened of it. Uh, those East German AFD people, that's what they want. No more change. Bang the table. No more change. Well, actually, those of us who do want change can read in the fear that they are expressing the imminence of the change that's coming. And I think that they can be defeated. Um, and I always finish by saying this. Those of us my age will remember that in the old World Cup, the Jules Rimet trophy, if you won it twice, you got to keep the cup. Do you remember that? Brazil won twice, so they kept the trophy. If we, if we defeat the far right twice, I think we will keep democracy forever. That's a nice last sentence. I would like to believe it. So yeah. thank you both very much. We have reached the end of our conversation. Even if we had more material for discussion, our time is now ending. I would like to thank my two comrades in arms on the digital podium, most sincerely. And I would like to ask Mrs. Kirschner and Mr. Bleser for the translation, as well as Karina Klein and Max Karbach for the organization and the technical support we had this evening. I hope that you all can take some of the things we just talked about with you. Um, and um, if you want to read some more, it's a thick book, but I think it's worth it. Um, I hope that you had a nice evening with us and would like to visit us again. 
at another digital event or in the museum when we are allowed to open up again next year. And if you like, from tomorrow on, you can virtually visit the Engels House in Wuppertal and wander through the new exhibition. We wish our partner all the best so they can open their doors in real life sometime next year. But now I wish you all the best and a nice Friday evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. It was Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Great.